Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Hope everybody's doing well today. Um, Matt and I are, are excited to, to give you the accounting and audit, auditing update for technology and life science, the CPE series uh, today, this afternoon. As was mentioned in the introduction, um, we will try and make this as interactive as possible. Please use the Q&A function and we will try and answer all the questions that come through there, uh, whether it's in the presentation or we'll contact you afterwards uh, directly and, <clears throat> and answer any specific questions. Um, so with that, I think we're ready to get going. Matt, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Charlie. And uh, as Charlie mentioned, excited today to, uh, to go over the accounting and auditing update. Um, my name is Matt Dobbins. I'm an audit senior manager um, in the Nashville office with Cherry Beckert. Um, I primarily focus on audits of both public and private companies in the technology, life science, and industrial industries. Um, I have a lot of experience serving both emerging growth and established companies in the middle market, especially around SEC reporting and technical accounting consulting, um, and uh, have been I had a pleasure to work with Charlie on quite a few of these engagements as well already. And uh, yeah, look forward to going over some of these topics with you. So, Charlie. Thanks, Matt. As Thank Matt mentioned, uh, I also am in the Nashville office. I'm an audit partner, assurance partner here, spending most of my time working with portfolio companies of, of PE and VC back firms in the tech and healthcare spaces. So with uh, those boring introductions and in out of the way, let's go ahead and get started in the meat of the program. Okay. And, and really, you know, 2023, um, it, it's been kind of a slower year with regards to implementation of big accounting standards. Over the last couple of years, uh, the, the private companies um, have, have been inundated with 606 and 842. And, and this year, the biggest topic that uh, needs to be implemented is this ASU 2016-13 the financial instruments credit losses. So basically the measurement of credit losses on financial instruments or CECL as, uh, as us accountants like to refer to it as. So today we're gonna to talk about how do we get here? If you notice this is an ASU 2016, which corresponds to the year that it was originally uh, written. And here we are in 2023 and it's finally being implemented. Um, what the scope is of the ASU, um, we're going to spend a lot of time on the key steps of adoption and implementation, and then we'll run through a couple examples uh, of CECL um, implementation and kind of documentation of what your auditors may be looking for. And then finally, we're going to end the day with just kind of an overview of some upcoming standards that may impact the technology and life science industries. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to try and keep this to 50 minutes, so we give you 10 minutes of your day back. That's right. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks, Charlie. We can jump right into uh, the CECL standard and, and talking through some of this. But um, just a, a little background that Charlie kind of referred to um, in the agenda slide. On, as you can tell, you know, this ASU 2016-13, first you see 2016 and you're like, wow, shouldn't we have already implemented that? Um, a lot of the times that's that would be the case, but obviously there's been uh, been some some uh, global things happen since uh, <laughs> since 2016, and also a couple very large and I'm sure for many of you some extensive standard updates between that time and now, being primarily 606 and 842 being the the main ones, and now CECL is here to essentially follow that. And as Charlie kind of alluded to, since the um, pandemic really in 2020 and 21, the, the board has not met as often to push out new standards or really had a lot of standards on the brink. So this is kind of the last of the previous standards prior to pandemic, if you will, that got delayed during the pandemic um, via one ASU that we'll go over briefly. Um, and so now, now it's here for basically all 
all private companies or now small reporting companies that were, uh, you know, um, had relief earlier on, I guess, um, from not adopting the standards. So um, we'll go through how it impacts um, the companies in, in this industry. And, and please, again, stop us, raise your hand or um, message in the chat if you have questions as we go. Um, but first, we'll start with how did we get here? Um, so how did we get here, right? Uh, first, if you go all the way back to the 07, 08 financial crisis, um, this highlighted a lot of historical losses that may not have been expected to occur in the future or may have been expected to occur in the future and created a gap between what accounting and finance were really trying to, when we were trying to co-mingle in the financial reports. So if in the old standard and legacy standard, there was, it really was based on if the collection wasn't deemed probable, then you finally book an allowance for it. Where now the, the board is saying, hey, let's fast forward some of these expected losses because like many other financial line items, you can project out or you're asked to project out what future expectations look like. Um, so here, the, the idea is to try and project out what your future loss is versus, hey, now we think this customer A is bankrupt. All of a sudden, we need to book an allowance for it. Um, so we'll go through some some topics here and some methods to approach that, the look back and the look forward. Um, but as a result of the financial crisis, the International Accounting Standards Board and the FASB both got together to evaluate how can we make improvements to this to try and do our best to help ensure that all the financial reporting for all these entities can be transparent as transparent as possible and try and commingle with you know, uh, look forward essentially for for expected losses. Yeah, try, I mean, essentially they were trying to marry up kind of what uh, <clears throat> markets expectations with historical accounting to kind of bring us together and and kind of uh, implement or uh, a, a little bit of forward looking expectations to incorporate in, into the historical financials. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. So like many of you probably, when you first heard this, uh, the announcement of the standard were probably like me, um, you thought about, okay, what's really going to be included in this? And the first thing that you, you thought of were financing receivables, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about banks and financing companies. And, and most of us probably back in 2016 thought, ah, this really isn't going to be applicable to my industry. But if you really drill down into it, uh, the scope of ASC, uh, 326 is is very inclusive um, to include not only the financing receivables, which banks and uh, other types of financing and lending activities entities will have to encourage, but also your health and maturity debt securities that you invest in, um, receivables uh, that are from revenue transactions, whether it's under ASC 605, 606, and 610. Um, those are both long-term and short-term receivables. Implementing the CECL standard is probably going to be easier on the short-term receivables versus long-term, but uh, all of, of your trade receivables are included within the scope of this. Um, so I think that's probably why most of you are on this is kind of understand a little bit of how it applies to trade receivables, what you need to be documenting for the auditors uh, when they come in to do the year-end audit and um, then going forward, what kind of historical information you need to make sure you can get. Other items within scope would be reinsurance recoverables, some off-balance sheet items that aren't considered to be hedging activities or, or derivative activities that fall under um, topic 815, um, and then just some receivables related to repurchase agreements. Basically, ASC 326 covers any financial assets that have contractual right to receive cash. So, um, Thus, our, our trade receivables are in it. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time when we give our examples is looking at how to implement CECL around the trade receivables. 
Um, just for purposes, because many people are probably wondering, are there any scope exceptions or can I can I get out of this in any way, shape or form? It's probably pretty difficult. Uh, but if you are measuring your financial assets at fair value with the changes in fair value running through earnings or net income, uh, you, you're exempted from this. Um, if you hold available for sale securities, those are exempted from the credit loss analysis. Um, loans made to participants of defined contribution employee benefit plans, pledges receivable for not-for-profit entities. So if we have any nonprofit folks on here, pledges receivable are exempted from this. Uh, receivables are arising from leases that are accounted for under ASC 842. And finally, policy loan receivables on an insurance entity. So think about if you get a policy loan on um, a cash render value life insurance or something like that. One thing to remember with regards to the scope of this is um, the standard is not just for banks or financing companies. Um, it, it is applicable across all industries. And the most applicable thing for the technology and life sciences are going to be trade notes receivable uh, and what you're going to have to analyze and review. So Matt, can you give us a little more detail on ASU 2016? Yes. Yep. Certainly, Charlie. Um, let's see. There we go. All right. So quick overview here of 2016-13 to Charlie's point. And um, here, uh, this first, the effective dates, um, it's for, call it all other entities that weren't described before, which really it was public companies have already adopted this unless you qualify as a SRC or a small reporting company um, or, or qualified as an EGC or an emerging growth company that could um, really get the um, uh, kind of delay this, this implementation up until now. But now it's all private companies, EGCs, small reporting companies, all are required to adopt for essentially this fiscal year 2023 that we're in now, um, any that are beginning after December 2022 and in interim periods therein. And um, kind of as referred to briefly before, um, this standard was first amended by 2019-10. And this 2019-10, if if many of you may recall or may not, um, it was really the delay of a few big standards that we've kind of touched on already, right? The delay of 842 and the delay of um, certain standards here within this topic in really enhancements made to uh, to certain standards within 606 as well. So really this is this was the delay to help kind of alleviate the pressure that was being felt on accounting departments to implement all of these big standards at once and try and say, hey, we know we we understand now you're going through a lot of standard implementations. Let's try and break these up for you the best we can and try and delay a couple of these. And also, um, as earlier mentioned, the pandemic had a lot to do with that as well. Um, so 2019-10 amended this, and now it's it's currently effective for, will be effective essentially for all other entities now. Um, so we've kind of touched on this, but it's really intended to um, improve the financial reporting um, that's requiring the earlier recognition of these losses, right? So when you think about this standard and the board's intention, it's really the need to create the economic forecast or to look at the economic forecast to help drive losses that may occur over the entire contractual life um, of, of a, a contract with a customer. And therefore, a lot of the board in, with this standard had to revert to historical loss information to help reflect that contractual term that we're referring to. So many of you in this industry, you hear contractual term, and I know from auditing a lot in this industry, your head automatically goes to potentially options, things of that nature with expected terms. It is actually similar in that nature when we talk about a contractual term here, 
when you have a plain vanilla option, you do a look back of the expected term to determine what your future outlook of volatility may be. Here, it's very similar. Hey, what's our contractual term with this customer? We need to take a look back or this customer class, and we'll get into that a little bit further um, here in a bit, but we need to look back at what that customer class or, or that customer, the history with them looks like and try and now project it forward with also baking in certain forecasts, economic forecasts and conditions that may be, may be particular to us as a business as well. Um, so we'll go through some methods again on how to do that. And uh, um, some methods that were more preferred by the board, we'll say. Um, but we'll also point out the board does not specify one specific method and uh, uh, allows ent is allowing entities to apply this based on a number of, of a few essentially selected methods that they, they would prefer over, you know, uh, maybe just a high level look back, right? Um, so then this here, so it'll, again, we've touched on this briefly, it'll replace the current impairment model essentially, or the probable model where you're saying, hey, our receivables, maybe it's now finally probable that it's not gonna be collectible. And now look at it over a lifetime basis. We can't reiterate that enough of the lifetime look forward of these, not just, hey, what aren't we gonna collect next year, but what is this group of receivables and how has our history been within this group and how will that project over the lifetime of our current outstanding receivables on a go forward basis um, and try and appropriately reflect an estimate of all expected losses and try and support these forecasts for these expected losses, which um, as many of you may, may know with other forecasting, with other financial topics, it can be difficult to support forecast and come up with the correct assumptions or key assumptions to projecting on those forecasts, right? So we'll go over what we think some uh, some keys to this projection model or this forecast model will look like. And then two, how we can help God to build up the evidence because for you know an auditor or build up the evidence for internal financial statements to say, hey, we feel comfortable that we're recognizing this future outlook appropriately. And we feel very confident in these assumptions and here's why. Um, yeah. Thanks, Matt. I think now it's time for our first polling question. Um, so we'll we'll launch. Matt, can you go to the next slide? Next slide here. All so, right. in what stage of CECL implementation are you currently? We'll give it a minute or so here to, for everybody to chime in and get CPE credit. I guess I need to answer too. <laughs> All right, are we getting close to response there? Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so majority of folks are in the have not started or in progress. So that's... Ex Kind of where I would expect everybody to be at this point in time um, in the year. Um, again, I, I, you know, I don't think this is going to be a heavy lift for most, but for some it might be. And um, you know, there are, are plenty of resources available for assistance, um, both inside Cherry Becker as well as externally. All right, moving forward, as as Matt kind of mentioned, we're just going to again summarize this a little bit. You know, the key provisions of this CECL model are that 
it requires the incorporation of forward-looking components into the recognition of the anticipated losses at the inception of your financial instrument of the receivables. So typically we're gonna see every clients start with their historical experience. It's generally the best point to start for estimating the credit losses, but you can't stop there anymore. Typically you used to say, hey, I have these receivables. We typically write off $50,000 based upon, you know, knowing these cl our client base and everything like that. Now you have to project that a little bit further. You need to consider kind of what current conditions are and what's expected in the future. The, the adjustments to the historical loss experience are intended to reflect differences in asset specific risk characteristics and economic conditions that are current and expected to occur in the future. So for tech and life science companies, this could be interest rate environment, uh, could be a supply chain consideration, could be new products uh, that, that are being offered to the market, uh, could be a shift in your your product makeup or in in you know your services that are being offered, or it could be uh, looking at what's going on with a particular segment of your customers, the giving raising rate environment and everything like that, or a decline in economy. Certain sectors of of the economy, certain industries in the economy are more prone to bankruptcy. Um, there also could be, you know issues with certain geographic regions. For example, if you have a customer base that's in Eastern Europe, um, you know, you, you might have to consider what's going to happen in the future or what's going on over there currently and evaluate whether or not that impacts your historical collection efforts from those clients. So in addition to this calculation and, and kind of going a little more in depth and being forward looking in your calculation of your expected losses, there's also a little bit of improvement or encouragement to improve your disclosures in order to promote an understanding of the assumptions and estimates. And your disclosures, of course, must be quantitative and qualitative. I'm not sure I've ever seen a, a FASB statement issue that didn't have that language in it. So that goes probably goes without saying. Mm -hmm. So Matt, why don't you walk us through a little bit the, of the adoption and kind of implementation steps for CECL? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to there. Um, so really the the five step model here, which um, for for many of you may have um, some nightmares potentially hearing five step model when going back to 606, we know um, the FASB's got a thing for these five step models, it seems like. But that said, um, you know, hopefully this will be a little bit more straightforward, um, a little bit easier to implement. Uh, but certainly a lot of key assumptions and key areas um, to note here as well. Um, but first, I mean, each each can be voluminous, voluminous and we'll dive in further to each as we go as well. But first step is determining what instrument types are within the scope, which Charlie went over the scope slide earlier um, and pointed out again, Please keep in mind here, these are at, focused on assets. We'll touch on it later, but some of these other impacted areas, it can start to can start to go down rabbit holes hearing preferred stock or equity investments, et cetera. Um, again, focused on assets here. So for for the sake of this discussion and this uh, this audience here, focus we'll focus primarily on receivables and measuring those. Um, but First, obviously, identifying those. Secondly, step two, grouping the assets or grouping these instruments within similar risk pools or categories of one another. Um, this is a required step. Now, it does have some caveats, and there is obviously, like in most standards, there's a little bit of gray on exactly what, how to approach, but there. It is a required step that is also um, also has a few different methods to approach, right? So this could be based upon the size of your receivables, all i.e. like all between a hundred and two hundred thousand dollars are grouped into this bucket, two two hundred to four hundred are in, in the next bucket, and so on and so forth. Um, it could be based on the region. Um, if you are primarily 
in two separate regions of the country or internationally if you're in you know one country overseas that and then the rest of your sales are domestic it might be smart or might be um reasonable to say or make the the policy election that hey these are our risk pools we have a separate risk for overseas and a and a uh you know, our second risk would be domestic. Um, another one could be your revenue streams. The really for um, one we'll jump into here in a bit will be for like a SaaS company with a few different subscription models. Maybe each subscription has, you know, an enter one is an enterprise type revenue where you're getting it from larger customers that you don't really have to. It may be longer to collect, but you don't really have issues collecting when collections come due. And another subscription may be on much smaller, more boutique customers where, hey, you do have a little bit more risk there of call it that company going under or the that company's ability to be able to pay you um, for the money owed. Um, so these are a couple just higher level examples that um, of how to kind of group these instruments in the second step um, into these these risk pools that the FASB is trying to to get to. Yeah, and you know another thing to consider also is if it, it kind of your expected terms. So if you have different terms for different customers, uh, that may be another um, risk consideration or risk pool. So yeah, that's a good point, Charlie. Um, all right. And then to step three, um, once you have these risk pools identified in step two, um, it's really then you're moving toward selecting your method for determining these losses, right? There's no, now, unlike the risk pools, that's a required step. There's no one required method. Um, these methods vary you know, all over, but there's, again, generally, and we touched on it before, generally a few methods that the FASB said that they prefer, we'll say, and a few preferred methods that honestly make practical sense um, when applying this standard into, into your model. Um, and we'll go over a couple of these as we go, but um, what method that you use will largely be determined by the type of financial asset and the data that's available to you as well. Yeah, um, and I, I think, you know, for for a lot of tech and life sciences companies, I mean, probably it, it's going to be like a, a lifetime loss rate or an aging uh, methodology is probably going to be what you all would see. And you think... Yes. Yeah. I think those, those methods probably make the most sense just based on, again, the, the financial asset, the type of financial asset, which here, for the most part, this obviously is an all-inclusive, but for the most part, we generally expect in these industries to be receivables, right? Um, yeah. And so just being the fact that it's the receivables and then data that's readily available, um, I think can fluctuate depending on really longevity of the company and, and uh, you know, historical financial systems and the accuracy of those systems, right? Yeah, and hopefully you'll be able to leverage um, your current systems and methods for recording an allowance um, and just kind of piggyback off that and use that as your, your springboard or your starting point. Yep, yep, exactly. And I think that kind of catapults into step four as well here in computing your historical loss experience. So um, this kind of moves back towards step two. This is a required step as part of the process. Um, you do have to have some sort of look back of historical experience to help determine this future estimate that we're building in here. Um, this assessment can be based on internal and external information, kind of as Charlie pointed out, market factors, market conditions, um, coupled with what your historical experience may be. Um, but especially those entities out there who haven't already been analyzing this history of losses or have been tracking it or have an easy way to track it, 
um, this could be the most difficult step for a lot of companies out there, right? And one of the more difficult steps to uh, substantiate from a, a company's perspective or an accounting department's perspective. And then also uh, to Charlie and I, we have talked about it before from an audit perspective, um, just ensuring that the completeness and accuracy, again, of that data is all there. Um, but the board yeah. has, sorry, go ahead, Charlie. No, I was just going to say, you, you know, like you mentioned, this is a required step is determine the historical loss. So, Matt, you know, what happens if, if you know, an entity doesn't have <laughs> the appropriate history? You know, a lot of life science and tech companies are, in their their growth stage and their emerging stage, and you know some of that information may not have be available. What is there? How do you get around that, or how do you get deal with that? Yeah, no, that's a a great question, and I think something that that too that uh, many in this industry can be familiar with, and to help relate it is. Uh, comparing it up to, again, going back to the stock option model and this contractual term that the FASB has laid out in this standard can be very relatable to an expected term in the in a plain vanilla option model and a Black-Scholes model that so many in these industry groups are, are accustomed to. Um, so, so with that said, think of in that model the vol a volatility calculation, you're doing a look back based on, hey, our expected term is six years of this option. We're going to look back, do a volatility look back of six years and then project that forward into the model to help project or estimate the expense to be incurred. So for many companies, there's no stock price out there to estimate volatility. There's they don't have volatility. It may be a private company where you have, you know, multiple comparable public companies that you're going off of. Similar light here, using those resources, the public companies that are out there that are comparables or the industry standards that you're reading online, et cetera. These things can really help drive that, that look back of historical losses. If a company does not have the history, maybe they were just recently founded within the last year or two. If there's no rich history to really help drive that, you're going to have to use the market indicators, the comparable public companies, um, and really your expectation and your forecasts based on other financial line items. If the company was formed recently and has has done an acquisition, most likely you have some sort of forecast for the acquiree. So at a minimum, you should be able to start looking at that and using those forecasts as well. Um, but that that's kind of, I guess, for step four and looking at that, not having a history. I mean, that's in general, probably the best, best bet is looking at those companies and then looking at uh, industry standards as well. But Step five is something we have touched on through this discussion as well on this adjustment um, of the historical loss experience. Um, and I think, Charlie, you'll dive into that quite a bit later as well. But um, just considering how the current conditions compare to what we expect in the future and trying to bake in some sort of um, percentage, if it is that, or or trying to project what may actually happen in the future. If you had, if your losses, when you look historically, have been tied up with one customer, one customer that you no longer have anymore as part of your receivables, outside of that one customer, you've collected just about everything. Maybe you may need to reflect that in your your forward outlook. And so that would be adjusting this historical loss experience for current conditions and then the forecast. Yeah, and you see that R and S there, and, and you'll you'll hear this a lot from your audit team is is reasonable and supportable. Um, <laughs> those are the the buzzwords of the year, I guess, and will be the buzzwords of the audit season. Is your your credit loss analysis reasonable and supportable? Um, 
And, and so we'll talk a little bit later about what, what constitutes supportable. Um, you know, reasonable is probably has to pass the smell test, so to speak. I mean, you can't come in, you, you know, if, if, if you were sitting there projecting out future considerations at the end of 22 into 23 and you thought, ah, rates are going to go back down to zero, that would not be reasonable. Right. <laughs> um, or, or, you know, you, you, you anticipated um, at the end of 23 rates to go up to 20%, uh, probably not reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just kind of using um, some common sense and in some, market-driven data uh, would be considered to be reasonable. Sorry, Matt. No, no, you're good. Completely agreed there. Um, all right. Uh, so we'll jump into now, Charlie, I guess, uh, kind of walk through really an example here and and talk through sort of like a Q&A, if you will, for uh, a practical example um, to help with the application of this standard and and approach here, right? Um, yeah, and I guess this is referred to as kind of the aging analysis method, which is probably one of the more common methods we expect to see clients uh, in, in your all's industry use. Um, so if you look on the next slide there, Matt, I think we've got a little bit of an example here. We've got this technology sell software to a broad range of customers, <clears throat> payment terms, but anyway, uh, kind of irrelevant in this, but we just included more detail for some reason. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we've, ABC Technologies tracked their historical loss of information. And, and you know, overall, it's been two and a half percent of their gross credit sales is, is what their loss ratio has been. And so, um in addition to look at what their historical loss ratio is, ABC Technologies mm -hmm. management team has gotten together. They've evaluated current conditions. They think that, you know, <clears throat> the interest rate environment's been steady. The political environment is, is steady. Uh, we're in a hypothetical world. Um, and <laughs> and that, uh, you know, looking out to the future, they they went out to the Federal Reserve and, and the Federal Reserve's forecast and they see modest GDP growth and, and estimated GDP growth over the next quarter. Um, and they they turn their and they look at that 120 days because that's usually about how long their receivables take to to turn in total. You know, some term within the first 30 days, some term. 1690. So, you know, you want to use a um, kind of a third party forecast that or a forecast that kind of mirrors your expected terms or collection terms on, on your receivables. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> ABC Tech also has it's kind of gotten their their mm -hmm. receivables and their credit sales together. And, you know, they've they've pooled based upon risk characteristics. Um, and so on the next page there, Matt, we, we've got after considering all that, we, we have $100,000 of sales, of credit sales. And so from here, you see, um, let's go to the, like in the middle here. Um, we know that on day one, $100,000, our historical write down has been two and a half percent. So $2,500. Mm -hmm. So we know that, that that's going to be what our write-off is, $2,500 of this $100,000 or sale, or that's what we're expecting. So 30 days later, <clears throat> we know that the total loss included in the balance is, is, is $2,500 or 4%. And 30 days later after that, we know the $2,500 is 8.3% is of the remaining balance, of the outstanding balance, and so on and so on until we get everything collected. So this aging analysis method takes these buckets and these historical loss rates by these buckets times the amount outstanding to kind of give you a CECL provision. And overall, it comes down to be <clears throat> this percentage here of the total outstanding AR at the end of your reporting period, which in this case is $10,000. So... You know, hopefully that that kind of makes sense. But you know, basically for for you companies, what you're going to have to know though, in order to use this methodology, is what your collections are by these aging buckets. 
uh, in order to use this innate aging analysis. Um, you also are going to have to know what your actual write-offs are and trace the amounts paid against the aging category, mm -hmm. as I said. Um, this method is, is able to most robustly calculate your loss rates per category as it gives appropriate weighting to each category. So, for example, you see here the past 90 days, you've got a higher percentage of those receivables that are going to be um, expected losses. Yeah, and so, I think, Charlie, yeah. here it's, um, you know, I guess quick to point out in that, you know, step four, step five discussion we were talking about, this is where we're saying how critical, and this kind of shows you how critical it is to have this RNS, the reasonable supportable forecast, but also the historicals to back it up. Right. And the better your historical information and your historical data, the better your reasonable and supportable forecasts are going to be. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if you don't have the historical information, this this method probably can't be used because yeah. <laughs> uh, you're not going to know what your collections by the time period or in the, in the aging hit buckets are going to be to be able to allow you to come down and calculate kind of what the historical loss rate is based upon those aging buckets. Yeah, exactly. You know, another word of caution on this model is, is that you need to make sure you're aware of kind of modeling anomalies, you know, especially, um, you know, if you have customers that consistently fall in a, a an extended bucket as far as payment goes, you know, let's say you you have customers that typically don't pay within 90 days, it's going to skew your model a little bit, uh, especially if, it, if they're a large customer. Yep. Um, so just be con cognizant of modeling anomalies that could exist um, when using this methodology. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. It's a good, good one for the look back analysis and historical. And then to your point, Charlie, measuring out that future economic condition, et cetera. But for the sake of the example, uh, much easier to show the historical buildup, right? But um, with that, we'll jump to a polling, another polling question here. Um, we'll go ahead and launch that. Give everybody just a minute. not applicable I, I, it must be most of <laughs> yeah no, that's good six or more that's a lot that, that that's interesting mm -hmm. and then uh one more polling question to follow that one up as well All right. Somewhat confident. It's pretty good. Yeah, like that. All right. So, you know, once we've kind of 
worked through our method and we've calculated our expected losses. Now we need to kind of disclose. And, you know, there's, again, limited guidance, I guess, inside the actual standard on, on the disclosure and things like that. I, you know, we scoured several 10Ks for small to medium-sized technology companies and life sciences companies. And this one from WM Technology Inc. Uh, from their 2022 10K is probably was the most robust as far as wording, and it's only three sentences. So uh, uh, disclosures this year, you know, not expecting voluminous paragraphs, but uh, in the second paragraph or in the middle paragraph here, there it says the company evaluates the expected credit losses on a pool basis that have similar risk characteristics. I mean, this is kind of the bare bones disclosure, but it meets the requirements, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, for for telling how they evaluated the risk characteristics and how they got their pools. Um, and then, you know, they include a, a role for their allowance. Um, I don't believe that is a required step, but. Yeah, um, I know the quantitative side is required, but I think, you know, you know just disclosing get, what you're. Right, and you could potentially get there with the. Um, what's in the paragraph, but um, but yeah, add a disclosure there. And from there, we'll jump over to um, some of the forecasting resources as well that um, can help in the you know future projections and analysis of those. And hey, where do I go to look at some of the market indicators? And how can I help substantiate these indicators um, for my auditors. My auditors are asking how I how I came up with this. These are great tools here to be able to utilize to to have something to call it to fall back on, if you will. Um, and to utilize too in um, in your projections and and help get the knowledge and um, the the supportable data there to help help project. Um, so then we'll jump over to um, some of these other impacted areas that uh, that we touched on briefly um, in the scope slide as well. Um, we'd just like to cover these to make sure that, um, you know, it's <laughs> clearly there. It's not the standard is not just for receivables, obviously. And but as you can as you can tell with what is here in these other impacted areas, um, there's a lot of reason why a lot of many people in the industry have pointed to financial institutions being the most affected by this standard. Um, because when you think about these financial institutions, this is what, a lot of what they have. But um, when it comes to the first topic on the purchase credit deterioration, um, just Again, a shift from the probable loss or impairment to an expected model. Um, and looking at controls too here to help figure out, all right, what's the credit worthiness of the portfolios of that investment? Um, and controls can help on the front end with that analysis and helping build that, that model for how you're going to implement this going forward. Um, on the equity method investees, I mean, you have, you know, many companies um, that funds, banks, et cetera, that, you know, you may have this some in these spaces, but really it's, you know, you're looking at the loans that are to an investee or an investment in a debt security um, at this point that, again, speeding up call it speeding up these losses that are expected to occur in the future rather than looking at them as being probable. That's the crux of this uh, this standard update. And then lastly, on the preferred stock um, that meets the definition of a debt security, that, again, to reiterate, do not think about equity and this affecting preferred stock on it, your preferred stock that's issued as part of your equity. Um, these industry groups... <laughs> I know that that probably is very prevalent. Um, please do not think that this is uh, pointing at that as part of equity on your balance sheet. This relates to investments and the assets on your balance sheet.
Yeah, I think on, on this, you know, just for the sake of time, we can probably move on to talk a little bit about another example, Matt. I think yeah. if we go on to some life science or, you know, just another example that could be applicable to both life science and technology here. Yeah, so here, um, kind of going back to the previous um, technology example, would take the, the same fact pattern that Charlie had on the $100,000 credit sale. You have $2,500 worth of historical losses or write-offs related to that. And this loss rate method, instead of projecting it by aging bucket, which, again, may be more precise for some, but hey, maybe you don't have the reasonable and supportable data to really dive into those aging buckets. And you need to look at this at a, a little bit of a higher level. It's, again, it's less precise, but it may be more ideal for many clients in these industries or many entities that are reporting here on these industries. But again, outside something to reiterate here, this is all the historical write-off and the historical look back where then again, you would take this two and a half percent applied to your total AR, but before applying two and a half percent, you'd want to look at the future economic conditions or future conditions of the company to see if you need to call it shift that percentage up or down slightly based on those conditions. But with that, um, just I guess a couple couple standards that we wanted to just put out in front of everybody here. That'll be impact, uh, impactful, most likely, for the next calendar year. Um, the first one being ASU 2020-06. Um, some of you may have heard this already, but um, really the intention is to try and eliminate a lot of the traditional BCFs you've seen in convertible instruments, um, but a very overlooked and potentially problematic change um, for private companies is it eliminates that get out of jail free card, if you will, for um, derivative liability accounting and requires you to essentially not to get too much in the weeds, but look at 81540. And if the instrument qualifies or it should be classified as equity under 81540. Um, so just, again, be aware of this, something you want to get ahead of. Um, and next week, um, we have, a, a, as part of the CPE series, there's another program next week, a decision maker's guide to financing arrangements that most likely will go through this sum with um, two Cherry Becker professionals as well. So, um, and, and really quick, the, the next one that for private companies is uh, effective for, for next year, for fiscal years ending, um, beginning after December 15, 2023. Is this um, ASU 2021-08 um, kind of improvement on the, the business combinations as it relates to contract assets and liabilities from customers? You know, the, the, the purpose behind this is to make sure that the acquisition date and acquirer um, accounts for the related revenues and the contract assets and liabilities in accordance with 606 as if they had originated the contracts. So this could impact, um, you know, kind of the purchase price allocation and, and opening balance sheet uh, in, in an acquisition, um, particularly around some of the deferred revenue is, is where we expect to see the most impact on this. So yep. um, I think that as we roll into 2024, calendar year 2024, uh, there will be some additional information on this, but uh we will uh, we'll send out more literature on it, but just want to make you aware that this could be impactful for those of you that are are actively making acquisitions or contemplating acquisitions, that this is something that the auditors will be looking for when they do the 805 analysis. And so with that, I think we have one more polling question. Yeah. Yep. yep, we can jump to that last polling question here. And as you answer that, you know, we appreciate your time today. And, and uh, you know, if there's any questions, please follow up. I know we tried to cram a lot of information in in a short period of time. 
Hmm. Um, but if there's specific questions on a, an adoption method or anything else, you know, please feel free to reach out to Matt and I or any of your Cherry Beckert uh, service providers. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend and a great holiday season. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.